Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kenneth Kunz, and I'm the president of the Board of Directors of the International Literacy Association. I am also a literacy coach, author, teacher educator, and the founder and director of For the Love of Literacy. We are really thrilled to have you here today as we have a program that is going to be a real treat for you. But before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping notes that I want to share with you. For those of you who are joining us live, hey, hey, the chat, hey, 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 hey. please make sure you mute yourselves as well. For those of you who are joining us live, please know that the chat is enabled. So feel free to connect with our active ILA community and share reflections throughout. Just so you know, we're almost at capacity for participating over Zoom, which is a great problem to have. But to ensure that everyone who wants to listen in can, we are simultaneously live streaming the discussion on Facebook. If you're watching via the Facebook live stream, we hope that you'll interact with other Facebook viewers. An ILA staff member will be monitoring the live stream for questions. You should know that the recording of this event will be available within the next few days. You'll be able to access that at literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events. Lastly, if you're tweeting along today, please remember to tag ILA at ILA today and use the hashtag ILA webinar. I'm excited to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Francis L. Gonzalez Garcia. Francis is a literacy consultant and former teacher, reading specialist, and district level ELA coordinator. She is currently the executive director and literacy consultant for Trinity Elite Education and Company, where she provides professional development to educators nationwide. We are so happy to have her join us today. And without further ado, please welcome Francis L. Gonzalez Garcia. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with everybody today and to be able to talk with you all about how we can foster literate identities for struggling readers. Um, for those who don't know me, I love to celebrate books. I love to bring books to everybody's homes and schools, and we just love to build book stacks. Books are definitely my happy place, as we say. Um, we love to celebrate books and book chats with teachers and fellow colleagues everywhere. Um, but I also love to celebrate literacy with teachers in their classrooms and showing them how we can elevate the reading practices in our classrooms with authentic reads and putting these good, great books into the hands of students and celebrating together. So what I want to know before we get going is, what are you currently reading? What's in your book stack? Put that in the chat for me. What are you currently reading? We are currently reading a great book at, in our book club, which is Twice a Quinceanera. Um, but I love reading picture books and YA books and um, so many other great reads, but I'd love to know what you're currently reading. I see some great titles there. Besides putting books into hands of students, lots of things that I like to ponder on as a reading specialist is asking, you know, am I getting the right books into the hands of readers? I want to know, you know, do I really understand my readers? Do I know where they're coming from and their background? And, you know, do they understand themselves as students, who they are as readers? My son early on uh, taught me a very important lesson when we were given a quote red flag of that he wasn't reading enough nonfiction. And that resulted us going to visit a bookstore and I asked him to go pick up a book of his choice and he came back with this particular title. What I ended up finding out was that AJ was already reading plenty of different genres and he was focusing on autobiographies and was doing some research. He was investigating the music industry. He was even curating his own text sets. The thing is that AJ was leaning towards more complex text. He was extremely interested in the content and the context it was being offered in, and also that the text itself presented opportunities to explore as a reader on so many different levels. And so 
he was teaching me very early on the importance of understanding what he liked to read and what he was gravitating towards. And so fostering identities was really important for him and for the students that I was working with and understanding that it's really crucial not to impose our own assumptions or our own identities on them. Being able to utilize texts in which they can see themselves in, relate to, or are actually interested in exploring themselves. And then understanding that expanding the concept of identity is important in understanding that it's more than just about understanding ourselves, but understanding and learning about others and inquiring new knowledge. And so I always tell my students, you don't know what you don't know. There's a great big world out there. And so we try to learn together, um, you know, this whole entire reading process and journey. I also learned early on that just because a reader can read, it doesn't necessarily mean that they love to read or that because they love to read, it doesn't necessarily mean that they always know how to read. And so my job is to make sure that I bridge the two so that they can embark on this journey and actually enjoy it. And so fostering a reader's identity includes how to foster their identity as a reader, a scholar, and then with themselves and with others. So some big concepts when we're looking at fostering a reader's identity with the respect of a reader is how are we differentiating instruction? How are we motivating them? And then how are we giving purpose to reading and to writing? We know that when we're focusing with our struggling readers that they all don't need help in the same areas or in all of the areas for that matter in reading and that reading itself is pretty complex. So we have to be really strategic in how we motivate our students and how we um, you know, lay everything out for them when it comes to supporting them. And so one of the things I like to do is to step up my own coaching. I like to find their strengths. You know, what are they good at doing? That helps build confidence for them. I want to know what they're interested in because that helps build on capacity. And then after figuring that, I want to load them up with plenty of literacy options and not just books because that builds on capital. I focus on areas in which I think is going to be best for them when it comes to skills or concepts. You know, do they need areas of support with regards to phonemic awareness or perhaps phonics or fluency, vocabulary, or even comprehension? But whatever area it is that they're needing some additional support in, it's really important to keep in mind that we want to tackle the concepts in context because we know that it is more powerful than isolating anything. And so anything that we do in our classroom has to be in support of literature. We have to have literature in front of us, all types of genres to get engaged and motivated as we're working through our concepts. Now, when we're talking about comprehension instruction, a really great visual is this layered model of effective comprehension instruction by Nell Duke. And I love this because it helps us understand that when practices need to be extended, it is definitely going to be differentiated based on student needs. And so if you have a student, for example, that is having difficulty with engagement with text, and that means they're having issues with text discussion and analysis, research and writing and response to reading or volume reading, then we know we can support them and just pull that particular ribbon out. That means extending that practice and being able to support that student based on their needs. Need. And every student, depending on what it is that they're needing, can be supported in this differentiated manner. And so I love this particular visual because it allows us to not only see how we can help support effective comprehension instruction, but actually holding ourselves accountable and understanding every single component and being able to support our students best with that. When we're looking at fostering a reader's identity as a scholar, there's some big concepts to take away from um, just the whole concept of the resource collection in general. And that's how do we activate knowledge? How are we supporting content knowledge? How are we supporting a wide range of reading opportunities, building text sets and making learning personal, useful and engaging? One of the great activities that was offered was taking activities from what we well know is Florida Center for Reading Research. And so taking a hands-on activity that's already been provided for you and then bridging that. So here we have an activity where students are focusing on words and they're focusing on the two vowel star cards, but they're bridging this and having now a created 
high interest teacher decodable text. So now we're looking at making the learning personal, we're making it useful, and we're making it engaging. But we can also take this concept and pair decodable with authentic reads. Wiley Blevins constantly reminds us of expanding these reading opportunities. And so we have a decodable text about the dog who likes to dig, then attach it to some great authentic reads. And while you're at it, might as well start building some text sets in partnerships with your students because we're trying to, again, expand this level of reading and options for students. So not only are we building it off of just decodable text and pairing it with some great authentic reads, but we're building these great um, text sets that help support inquiry and a vast variety of genres for students to explore. We also know that it's important for children to be motivated, and so we want to make sure we intentionally design activities for students to be motivated. So one of the ways we do this in supporting our scholars is looking at how we gamifying skills and again offering a wide range of reading opportunities. One of the activities I like to do with my students is anchoring literacy. And so we take concepts like phonemic awareness and phonics and vocabulary development, and we use anchor charts to where we start practicing these skills and we build on them, but they are so invested in it because they're the ones that are contributing to this. And so they'll do some self illustrations on there. They can bring in objects, they can bring in magazines, newspaper cutouts or photos, but we will start with illustrations. And so they will illustrate themselves and we'll start with phonemic awareness. And then from there we'll bridge in phonics. And then from there we'll bridge in vocabulary development. But what if we take this and we tie authentic learning with authentic read? And so what if we tie in, for example, um, a great book and we start reading together some um, wonderful literature and we start making observations and connections. And so students then start illustrating or selecting illustrations um, that are being inspired from the text, right? To then bridge it on over to what we're trying to learn. So it would be something like, you know, one of the students has said, we're going to go ahead and illustrate a van, for example. And so it would be a question with phonemic awareness, how many phonemes do you hear in the word van? And so we would use sticky notes or manipulatives to work through that. And then we would take it to the next layer of bridging it and saying, let's match the sounds to the letters. And so, of course, we would start doing that to demonstrate building on these concepts. And again, not doing anything in isolation, but doing multiple skills um, and working together with it. But then we'd like to develop, you know, the vocabulary and extend that. So we're working with phonemic awareness and then we're bridging it to phonics. It's like, how can we then expand vocabulary? And so we like to turn this into a game. Here we have a van, we've worked through this. And so I'll post questions like, what are some other words we can use for this illustration? Can you give me another word for van? Or what are some words that come to mind? So in the chat, give this a shot. What would come to mind if you saw this picture? What's another word that comes to mind? Jot that down in the chat. I see some good departure, moving, trek. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is great because we're talking about building vocabulary. We're already here. We might as well just drive it home, right? And so some of the responses that my students would give me is automobile. And I would be like, that's really impressive. Vehicle, moving truck. And then they start doing some associations like the Amazon truck, right? And then from there, you have responses like the mystery machine. And so a lot of students are like, what is a mystery machine? And of course, the student would actually bring a visual so that they could see a real mystery machine. But they had so much fun in being able to expand and make these word associations. So not only did we start focusing on, you know, having a great read and being able to have a, a great conversations about it and connections, but we focused on tying in skills like phonemic awareness and then phonics and then expanding that with vocabulary development. Even when they're sharing their responses with me, and I don't jot them down immediately, we'll start even challenging each other to see, you know, can you determine how many phonemes are in vehicle? And it's a challenge for them. So they end up turning this activity into their own games. And again, building on multiple concepts by using an authentic read. 
You can also elevate this learning opportunity by adding a QR code. And so adding a QR code can allow for opportunities for students to be able to create demonstrations or videos of their words or using Flipgrid. They can also create digital dictionaries, for example. They can create their own book that was inspired by an authentic rate. And they can use their QR codes for the audible version. And this, of course, is a great way for them to be able to practice fluency and have you know, their own voice and, and ownership in what they're developing. They can also focus on building knowledge. Not only do we ask questions based on the book and the conversations that we're having, but we can generate questions based on the books that they've developed. And we can generate questions in partnership. And so it's really important to have these QR codes embedded with them not only reading, but these QR codes can also trigger questions so that they can have conversations as well. To further the application, when we're looking at foundational skills and building on comprehension and expanding reading opportunities, there are so many different types of tools that exist out there. You have Elkonin boxes and whatnot. But again, tying in great literature helps elevate not only the skill, but building up other important skills for students and experiences and exposure to literature. In the ILA resource, there is a really great um, example and visual of what you can do. So we are working with a mat, for example, and building on some basic fundamental skills. On the back of the mat, we can include questions like a comprehension a question bookmark for metacognition. You can include sentence frames. And so this becomes multi-purpose in that we're focusing on multiple skills, we're tying in literature, um, and then we're turning in our tools and also framing it in a way where they can, you know, be able to take a concept and elevate it with multiple strategies and concepts as well. So these are great reading tools for students to be able to utilize. And of course, if you are building with authentic text, you wanna look at how can you foster inquiry? Awake has to do with um, how to handle spiders and it could be about um, how do you deal with bravery and contraptions and whatnot. And so when students are building text sets, we're looking at everything that's inclusive of books and magazines, newspapers, articles, graphic novels, podcasts, YouTubes and webs, anything that we can actually put in so that they can explore and build and foster inquiry. We know that it's also important when we're looking at games and getting our students to feel like they're part of the whole process and being engaged with that, that we wanna customize it in a way that increases engagement and motivation. And so again, taking concepts from the Florida Center of Reading Research and turning them into personal games, bringing in objects, having students be able to contribute to that just elevates the engagement in the classroom and then of course the learning. You want to think about how you design and support motivation when you're practicing and using games. You want to make sure that it's personal, that it's useful, that you provide the right amount of challenge, and then you offer them opportunities to actually play. It's important to play. And so we play. Um, my students love to read books that offer us opportunities and where we can play. And so ROT was one of our favorites that we like to use in the classroom. And so we would use this particular piece and we would read about it, we would discuss it, we would have fun with it, and then we would play the literacy hot potato. And the literacy hot potato was really simple to do. We brought in some um, sacks and then students would just pass them around and the person that ended up with the, the sack had to answer a question. And so whatever the question was, they would talk about it together as a team, and then a person would be a spokesperson. But the questions that we were uh, creating and doing with this particular book would vary. It could be questions on fundamental skills. It could be questions on comprehension. It could be critical questions. We would determine what type of questions we wanted to ask and pose, but it was something to have fun with our students um, and movement and games and whatnot, and they loved it and they love to talk and play. But you can also gamify literacy foundations using digital tools and authentic reads. And so using um, slides and embedding book trailers and authentic reads for students to be able to have that as a front-loading experience to some great authentic literature helps elevate, again, 
um, the exposure to literature, but then tying it into a concept. And so students are trying to focus on, for example, phoneme uh, substitution. We would have illustrations on there for them, attached with moat so that they had some type of audio support. And then they had a self-check. And so once they checked themselves, if they had it correct, they kept on going and they would earn points. Um, if they didn't get it correct, there was always an immediate video for them to be able to access where there was like an right on demand coaching for them to demonstrate how the concept worked and then to try it again and show them different models. And so if we did this together, I was able to coach them on the spot. But if they were doing this independently or at home, I duplicated myself by embedding myself in a video for them so that they had me with them if they were having any issues. And so this is another way to gamify literacy foundations by having authentic literature and then having some type of a game for them to be able to utilize in practice. The other thing we want to talk about is fostering a reader's identity with self and others. And so the big concepts with this is what are the real reasons we read and write? How do we help support social collaboration? And then how do we look at genres? Do we know what type of lens we use when we are reading? We know that when we are reading and writing for authentic purposes, we have some type of growth predicted in our reading and in our writing. We also know that's really important to choose texts that have rich ideas, sophisticated themes, because this helps students build world and word knowledge, and it helps them with their reading from there on out. And so when we are using literature, you know, we try to select literature that is going to help have successful and impactful talking points, and it helps support social collabor collaboration and hidden talking gems as well. And so we use QR codes, for example, that are hidden within the, the text. Um, or sticky notes. And while we're using these reads to have great talking points, like having a hopeful social message or addressing stereotypes and the identity or inclusivity or implicit bias, we have these QR codes that are embedded. It's kind of like a hide and seek, right? You, you're doing a scavenger hunt as you're reading, you're interacting with the book, but you're also having this collaboration with conversations with your peers. And so it can ask questions like, how do you see yourself in others? Or it can turn to a page where it's asking comprehension questions off of the QR code. It can ask you critical thinking questions. It can have questions that drive critical conversations or it can have concept questions as well. And so these QR codes help drive the collaboration and the conversations within our, our groups that we're having. Um, but again, trying to figure out what are we going to be talking about and utilizing and why are we reading these books? It can also trigger um, questions that are genre based and also by integrating multiple skills or questions that are generated again with students in partnership. And so while there are some QR codes that are hidden within the book, students may have other questions that they'd like to ask. And so we'll embed them on there or we'll have them on sticky notes or we'll have an ongoing document where we're able to house everything so that um, th these questions continue to build um, and we can always reference back to them. The other thing that's important when we're looking at literature is, you know, how are we understanding the importance of genres? And so when we are focusing on reading and we're focusing on the reading lens, for example, I'm going to be reading an article very differently than I do when I read a book. And I need my students to be able to be able to uh, be able to discern from that. And so if we're having conversations about the importance of books or book donations or change makers or the issues related to pollution that all stemmed off of conversations from digging for words, I want my students to be able to go and explore other types of texts and articles and be able to be uh, discern the two. Um, and that has to do with the genre itself, right? We know that genre embodies forms which contains functions and features that influence how we come to understand a text and its purpose. And so a tip that's offered in our resource collection is taking a simple strategy, for example, like summarization. How do you summarize a book versus how do you summarize uh, a piece of article? You know, it's really interesting to be able to discern the two and know the features and understand their purpose and see how they differ. 
we read these books differently and for a reason. And so it's powerful for them to be able to learn how to do that so that they're able to take away from the text appropriately. Last, as we're exploring literature and whatnot, it's finding a reason and real reasons to read and write. And so we were reading two books and we we're talking about building community and we were reading Fry Bread and Thank You Amu. And when we were doing that, there were embedded recipes. And I had a student who came and said, you know, I found this and noticed that this recipe box has um, instructions in both English and in Spanish. And so we start talking about what are real reasons that we want to read and write? What if we took this topic and we pitched it out for conversation with our readers, right? What if we start bouncing ideas back and forth with our students on ways we could help businesses and people in general understand the importance of making things more relatable and accessible for everyone? What if a person couldn't read the directions on this box? Could there be a way to help support them? And what if students start looking at their own self-created written pieces with embedded recipes and begin having these discussions on how they could adapt their versions to be more inclusive and relatable to their own peers. And so when we're looking at activities and the things that we're using in our classrooms, we're trying to support not only readers in the lens of a reader and a scholar, but we're trying to look at how do we impact everybody all together and how do we find ourselves in our identity of a reader and understanding that it goes well beyond a skill. It goes well beyond a book. It's trying to figure out ways in which we can create opportunities and being able to see ourselves when we don't feel like we're being seen. And so literacy opens the doors for endless opportunities. And so these activities for the students is to be able to understand that they're all invited in being able to do these types of activities and being able to extend the opportunities in finding their identities as a reader and as a scholar and being able to engage with themselves and with others. So these activities are just the skim of what the IL re ILA resource collection offers. Um, I'll have some resources that I'll be providing for you as well so that you can take these resources and activities and be able to implement them um, for you and your students in your classrooms. And Ken, I think I'm going to pass it right on over to you. I'm here. I promise I didn't go anywhere. I'm just taking <laughs> copious notes. Um, like you, I've, I found a lot of really awesome gems in the resource collections. And I think, um, you know, as a literacy coach, there's that exciting part about combining the science with the art as you're working with teachers. And so as I was taking a lot of notes, um, it was really occurring to me that you've been able to take a lot of the science and the research around literacy and um, put your own uh, creativity on how to engage students in the classroom. And so I know that as I was watching the chat, there were so many people um, excited about some of the resources that you promised to share, but there were also um, a lot of folks uh, trying to keep up with all of these great activities because there is, um, just so much value in carrying these out with our students. And you could see the um, chat is lighting up with a lot of excitement around the uh, resources that you've shared so far. So um, for those of you who are participating in the webinar right now, um, just know that you can always add additional questions to the chat. Our ILA staff who do an amazing job at hosting these successful events are always monitoring the questions that you have. These questions not only help us to um, engage our speaker like Francis, who's going to uh, participate in a brief Q&A, but also for us to continue to produce the materials that help to serve you in your role as, as literacy educators. So we're really, really excited about that. So Francis, I'm going to go with this first question because I think um, this was definitely something that I was also excited about. Um, you were kind of taking a lot of traditional, I, I don't want to say traditional tools, but tools that we've come to love as literacy educators like readers notebooks and anchor charts. And you've been adding these really interesting digital layers to them. And so when I saw the QR codes, um, that was definitely something that I was really interested in. 
And I noticed that a number of our participants in the chat were really excited about that too. Somebody said um, in the chat, and I thought this was a great question, what are some of the resources that you use to create videos for students where they might be able to read along at home or where teachers can really embed themselves with scaffolded support for readers? That's a great question. So I love Flipgrid. We use Flipgrid for pretty much everything when we're housing um, videos of students, but we also just do uh, traditional videos off of an iPad and storing them onto a Google Drive and sharing them through hyperlinks that way. Um, and I would also say, aside from Google Drive and Flipgrid, sometimes we just do digital portfolios where we have a platform that may be free and we're able to share that with parents as well. But my two are Flipgrid and um, housing things with Google Drive um, and hyperlinking those videos. That's the best and easiest way I would think. If anybody else has other ideas, please put them in the chat as well. I know we have some techie folks here also. Yeah, we actually, um, I appreciate Stephanie also added Ed Puzzle to the mix and yes. so many of the ILA participants. I remember one of the um, participants in today's event said, send me anything, I'll take whatever I can get. And so <laughs> I definitely felt that way too, uh, taking notes as you were presenting. Mm -hmm. um, it okay. also seems like hot potato is a really popular strategy. And I just thought that was really exciting because sometimes we forget to, to embed music and to also include joy in our literacy classrooms. And so we see a lot of folks who are interested in using that and also maybe um, adapting it for the content areas. Christine has this idea about using it for areas like science and social studies. Have you ever done that or what's, how do you how do you carve out this time for hot potato? <laughs> so hot potato came about when we were reading um, Rot, and we loved um, the whole concept of the character himself. Um, and so we were like, "How are we going to have fun with this?" And hot potato, of course, came with that. And as we were playing and doing comprehension questions and activities and whatnot, we actually started, you know, um, investigating. Some students wanted to know about the French fry and the history of a potato. Um, and they wanted just to know about agriculture. And then we just started fostering inquiry in that sense. And so students were running with that. Um, but the hot potato was just to have, again, some fun, some uh, game taking place in the classroom. It linked perfectly to the character um, and they just loved it. It's something for us to be able to enjoy um, while we're tapping into multiple, you know, again, strategies and skills and comprehension and just having a good time. One thing that I always like to emphasize is that if students are having, um, you know, a good time, they're enjoying the activity as a teacher as well, you're enjoying that. There's so much that you take away from it. And so that is what we like to do with a hot potato. We'll do the comprehension, we do the game, but then we foster inquiry and we start investigating um, about the potato itself. Um, and we do arts and crafts, we'll do anything that they want to do um, that stems off of whatever piece we're working with. That, that strategy particularly stuck with me. Um, I, was meet, I was meeting with my coaching team this morning and we were talking about how last year when we were doing the reciprocal teaching strategies with our teachers, many of them felt as though they needed more exposure to that. And so I think you know, I would love to use hot potato as a way of sort of reinforcing um, those practices as we get back into classrooms and, and reconnect with students. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing that came up in the chat, which I thought was really interesting, was that um, we did have some of our attendees ask, you know, what grade level could you see these strategies? And Nikki Mancini, the uh, president of New Jersey Literacy Association, she said, honestly, I could see middle schools loving this. Are you finding that to be the case that some of the strategies that you shared today uh, span different grade levels? Absolutely. Um, they go from elementary, and I'm going to be honest, all the way to the university level. These are things that we do just to have fun. 
we do this with teachers, you know, when we're doing professional development and we're actually doing hot potato together um, and you're seeing the teachers engaged and having fun with it. Um, these are strategies and, and games and tools that you can use with pretty much anybody at any age level. Um, it's just to, again, facilitate the whole process of literature and literacy and enjoying it. And so anything that helps with tools and engagement can be used across the board, I would think. Oh my gosh, during this Q&A time, our, our cues have definitely blown up. I um, notice another question says, expanding on that use of hot potato, do the students talk as one group and the person who has the potato shares the answer? How does that, how does the um, accountable talk happen during that time? Great question. And so when the student who ends up with the hot potato um, looks and views the question, they're the spokesperson. The whole concept of the hot potato is for them to be able to have collaboration and talk about the question together versus just having one student answer and come up with the, the conclusion. Um, so the question is posed, the team talks about it together, and then the person who's holding the hot potato is the spokesperson for the team. And so this helps with collaboration. It helps them with having um, discussion and just having some ideas from one another. You know, some people interpret things very differently, or you learn from each other in the conversation. And then it also helps with oral language development, because the person that's going to have to speak is going to represent the team. And so it's just a great way to have collaboration, to support oral language development, um, and just, again, having a space for them to be able to talk and bounce some ideas with one another. And of course, we do it intentional where they all have to take turns to catch that potato and kind of keep an eye on them with that. Um, but it's just to give them that opportunity to be able to socialize, collaborate, engage, and then, again, focus on oral language development when they're speaking. Great question. No, I think that's, that's such a great piece of advice for teachers because especially when we're working to address the needs of multilingual learners in our classes. So many schools have trained around the use of content objectives and language objectives. And I think how fun would it be for students to come into class and see that the language objective includes the game of hot potato as part of getting students to, to speak and listen. So I am gonna move in a little bit of a different direction with one of the questions that came in through the uh, chat. And I think this is a great question. How do you recommend differentiating some of the digital instruction that you've shared for students who have visual impairments? So all of our digital activities or any digital activity that I, I ever create for my students, I make sure that it's also transferable in a hard copy for them. So for example, um, the activity that I had where it was um, phonemes and it had the book trailer or whatnot, I would have that printed for them. Um, it has the audio, they have the QR to be able to hear and follow along. But on the digital access itself, I make sure I include things like moat where they're able to hear um, and follow along in that way. Um, students who are not comfortable with the digital access to that, they need to have an option. And so I try to make it where if I have it digitally, I have it as a physical adaptation for them as well and trying to bridge that for them so that they have choices. Thank you so much. And you're definitely getting a lot of confirmation in the chat too about <laughs> the value of Mo as such a great extension. Yeah, so absolutely. I knew when you did this that this question was going to come up as part of our event. Um, I started writing down book titles. And of course, Rot definitely seemed like a great way to build community uh, with students. And it looked like such a wonderful text. So one of the questions that obviously followed that was, there are so many good books out there. Do you have a list of your favorite books that you use in the classroom? I do. I have lots of lists. I love to build lists of books, but it's with collaboration of fantastic people like the people that are here today where you're collaborating with everybody and everybody's sharing book titles. I think that's one of the reasons why I always start off by asking, what are you currently reading? That's a pressing question when you meet anybody, right? What are you reading? But the books that I do put together is not by myself. It's always with the help of my students, to be quite honest with you. Um, they are my go-to. They're the ones that go out and read books and come back and bring some titles. And so while I'm collaborating with colleagues and putting these book lists together, we always make sure that we're doing it in partnership with students. 
And so I have several book lists that I can share um, with themes and whatnot if people are interested um, that I've created and have also extended with the support of my students who have pitched in their own titles as well. So you're definitely getting a lot of love in the chat for wanting to see those resources. Um, I have a question for you, um, and this question really comes from me. I was really excited to see you talk about um, creating student-centered and really student-directed text sets when it comes to mentor text. And I think a lot of classroom teachers feel really comfortable about selecting mentor text for reading and writing instruction, but maybe have not had the experience of personalizing those text sets for students. If I were to get started with that, especially with so many new teachers being in the field, what, what are some tips that you might provide so that way we don't get overwhelmed by having too much to do? Having too much to do with the mentor text that you're curating or... Or like the planning and organization of it. Of building the text sets. So I always recommend starting small. You know, start with a couple of titles that you're looking to link together um, and looking at the concepts. And I always tell everybody to start small with like two or three books because we find very quickly that these books lend themselves to multiple uh, skills and strategies or whatnot. They serve as a great springboard. And so if I'm going to start building text sets, um, I like to start with just a few so that I'm able to elevate those and optimize those um, and then bridge them slowly by expanding them. And so if I'm going to be using a text set for um, mentor text, for example, um, I'm going to start with maybe one particular title, see what I can get out of that, all the skills having to do with literacy, and then bridge it little by little by building um, and adding titles to it. But I always recommend starting small with your text set so that you're not overwhelmed. The whole concept of, of expanding these text sets for students, for example, is just to be able to give them options. Um, but for myself, if I'm going to be building text sets for teaching purposes, I try to keep them, you know, to a minimum um, and optimizing the text set that I have. I hope I answered wow. that for you. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's really powerful advice, because even if you start with a few focused students in your class who you are trying to help identify their uh, reading identities, or maybe even spark more motivation. I think that's such a great way to, to get to know them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't see any additional questions coming through the chat or through our back channel right now. So I definitely wanna provide this opportunity for you. Um, are there any last impressions or thoughts that you wanna share with our ILA community? They are out in full force on this weeknight. You know, I, I want to just go back to the concepts of what was provided with the collection that's being offered. You know, I shared this before that I'm just skimming the surface. There's so many best practices that are embedded in research and help support drive instruction for us and making life a little bit easier when everything's already curated. And so when I'm looking at these resources myself and I'm thinking there are a ton of ideas for us to be able to implement easily um, and then be able to expand and, and drive home, you know, any other additional concepts that we want by adding our own um, personal style to it or ideas. Um, it's just a great resource and tool to know that you've got everything housed in one area, your go-to area. And so having this resource and knowing that um, is very beneficial. And this session is just, again, like skimming the top of what is in there um, in that particular um, component. There were videos, there were helpful articles, and it was like um, professional development for yourself and being able to collaborate with colleagues. And again, taking these activities and seeing how can you implement them and make use of them in your own classroom. And so I absolutely love being able to explore and work with these resources and being able to tie them in into what we do in our classroom and sharing it with others. You know, that's such a valuable thing to hear. I know at ILA, we always want to do the heavy lifting around the research and the, the uh, collections of resources. And for a, really a skillful coach like you to be able to take that information and make it practical and really motivating for your students is just amazing to see. The pictures that you captured in that presentation, I know, 
just um, show the authenticity and the, the joy that you bring to the students and teachers that you work with. So on behalf of ILA, I definitely want to thank you for, for that. So there is another question that came in through the chat, and I think this is a great question, given that sometimes our, our instruction has been forced to switch to um, remote, hybrid, or even different flexible modes of learning. Do you have any games um, for engagement that you would recommend for remote, hybrid, or digital learning spaces? That's a great question. I, you know, I, I create most of my games, and if I'm doing hybrid, um, gosh, that's just a really, that's a great question. You know, it's just trying to figure out how can we have fun online as well. So when we're doing hybrid um, and something live, it's trying to take the concept of figuring that out. So off the top of my head, no, I don't have like some recommendations for that, but I do have some creative that I can share um, that are for hybrid um, that I wouldn't mind sharing, but off the top of my head, not really. I see some in there. I see. No, yeah, I was going to say our, <laughs> our, I, and I think this is, that's such a great question. I know we had talked um, earlier about how you don't have to answer it now. There might be some great opportunities for, for some follow-up. Um, certainly you are such an active part of our ILA community. We know that um, we'll be continuing to work with you, but our members are dropping some of their own uh, tips and tricks I into the that, chat. Yeah. And so we really appreciate that from, from all of you. Oh. What a great event. So it, are there any last thoughts that you want to share before I wrap up our, our event for today? Just a final piece of advice for everybody. Enjoy reading. Enjoy celebrating it with your students. Um, that's what we're here for, is celebrating each other and celebrating literacy. And so if we just do that together, um, I think we can move uh, forces and do lots of great things in our community. Francis, I just want to thank you so much for being here and sharing this wonderful information with our ILA community. Um, this has been amazing. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who joined us to take part in this event. Just a reminder, the recording of this event will be available within the next few days. And you're also going to be able to access that at literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events. Before you go, please also make sure that you mark your calendars for our upcoming ILA webinar, which is going to be on September 21st from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 10 research-based answers to essential questions about phonics and phonological awareness. This ILA webinar, which features Heidi Ann Mesmer, will offer practical techniques that can be used in the classroom based on key questions about phonics and phonological awareness. Registration for this event is now open. In addition, please mark your calendars for our upcoming ILA intensive on October 20th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on putting word study into practice. This ILA intensive, which will be hosted by Donald Baer with a keynote by Freddie Hebert, will share and model word study activities across stages, along with hands-on ideas for student-centered learning and instructional routines that yield results. Registration for this event is also now open. Please keep an eye on the digital events webpage, literacyworldwide.org backslash digital events for these upcoming events and additional on-demand content. If you're not already following ILA on social media, make sure to do so for the most up-to-date information. Thank you again and have a great week, everyone.